of this market customer intelligence through research that you've done, whether yourself or from other sources, to find a viable business opportunity. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to Entrepreneurship 101. A belated Happy New Year from me, as I haven't been, uh, I haven't been to Entrepreneurship 101 since last year, so it's nice to be back and to see everybody in person. Uh, my name is Carrie Damon. I'm the Director of Entrepreneurship Programs here at Mars, and it is my pleasure tonight to uh, introduce my manager, actually, who is one of the senior leaders at Mars and does a number of things to build um, and help entrepreneurs in the startup community. But before I introduce Usha Srinivasan, I do have one announcement, or actually a couple announcements. I would like to um, have, extend a warm welcome to our satellite groups, uh, NORCAT in Sudbury, Innovation Fa Factory in Hamilton, and Haltech in uh, Haltech Hall in Halton. And I also wanted to note that we have a really interesting Mars Best Practices session that's happening tomorrow. You might have seen it on, on the pre-slides the pre before the video. Um, it's with one of our, our team members, John Warren, who's now an entrepreneur in residence at Mars. And he's doing uh, a session on business model analytics, how to manage and guide your lean startup. So for those of you interested in really following the lean methodology for your startup, he's developed some um, original content on how you might measure the success of the experiments that, and the iterations that you run um, th while you're trying to run lean. Um, the early bird price is $15, and I think there are still some uh, seats left, so check that out online or in our events section. And tonight we are talking about market intelligence, customer discovery, and market intelligence. This is a lecture that's really been evolving over the last few years as customer um, discovery and development has become more and more popular as a really important methodology for startups to use. Getting people out early to talk to customers and getting customer insights before they spend a lot of time and energy building their product or service. Um, if you've been to our workshops, you know we, we introduce these types of um, methodologies very early on. So in the fall, we talked about the business model canvas and the value proposition. Um, I think next year we'll actually have this session before we even get into that because customer development and discovery is so important. Our speaker tonight, Usha, is the VP of Learning and Insights at Mars. Not only does she manage the entrepreneurship education at Mars, she also manages um, a very large team of 10 people that do market um, intelligence. So how many people here are Mars clients? So how many have gotten market intelligence services? A couple. So if you become a Mars client, you actually get access to some tremendous resources that Mars has subscribed to to help you find secondary market intelligence for your business. And Usha will probably explain a little bit more about um, those resources and how that works. A little bit on her background. Um, prior to joining Mars, she worked at Frost & Sullivan, which is a, a leading global market research and consulting company. And she published a number of key research papers, consulted for companies of varying sizes, and managed a group of analysts to provide quality research. She has a lot of technical and industry background in water, environment, and building technologies. Um, and she's worked with global clients such as GE, Siemens, American Water, IBM, Honeywell, and Brita. She holds a Bachelor of Science in Microbiology from the University of Bristol and has a PhD in Environmental Sciences from the University of Aperte in Dundee, Scotland. She is also an NRC Fellow and has completed postdoctoral work at the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency and University of New Brunswick. Um, I think when she first came to Canada, she went and worked up in the Yukon as well, um, helped to research and write the State of the Environment report for the Yukon Territories. So she's very active in the clean tech space um, as an advisor with clients as well. With that, I'd like to welcome Usha Srinivasan. Thank you, Kerry, for that kind introduction. Good evening, everyone. Um, so I wanted to start the evening with a question. So Carrie asked the question, how many of you are Mars clients? And I just was interested, you know, there are probably various levels of interest in entrepreneurship here today. Um, how many are, of you already have started a business? Great. Keep your hands up. <laughs> Keep your hands up. Next question. Um, how many have you actually started to talk to customers um, as, as part of your business? Keep your hands up. <laughs> OK. Um, how many have you spoken to at least 10 customers? As some of the hands have gone down. How many have you spoken to 30? 
plus customers. Some hands are going down. Good, so you understood that it is absolutely critical for you to talk to customers before you launch into any of your solution or product that you want to sell. Um, as Carrie mentioned, this is one of the, probably the fundamental things, the important things that you need to do as you uh, launch into your business. Okay, I, you heard a whole bunch of different uh, uh, descriptions of who I am, but uh, linking all of them is uh, my expertise in research. So next 40 minutes or so, um, I'm hoping to share with you my collective background of various types of research that has brought me to this juncture working at uh, Mars. So I am a uh, scientist by training, as Carrie said, and research is all about being inquisitive and finding the insight in, in various things that you do. Um, I took that uh, strength and I moved to the market research space. And that was a different kind of uh, insight building in helping companies grow uh, in different markets and acquiring companies and so on, which brought me to, to Mars here. And I'm uh, privileged to be able to have uh, set up resources for entrepreneurs like yourself who, as they grow their business, are able to access some critical market information and make some sound decisions as they grow their business. So, what are we actually talking about here? So what is this market customer discovery thing? What does it mean? Most of you have, um, as you indicated, I think probably less than 20% of you put your hands up that you have a, a startup or, uh, at the current time and the rest of you are thinking about it. So you have an idea in, in mind that um, you assume that there's some assumptions you're making that, okay, there are a group of customers that I think they would be interested in my, in my solution. And um, you have some hypothesis uh, around what distribution channels that you might use to get to those uh, customers. And you're gonna make some guesstimates maybe about you know, what price point they might pay for your solution. So what is the one thing that's really important here that might be missing in all of those assumptions? What is the one thing that you really need to know? Anyone? Volunteer? Go ahead, shout out. No? Along those lines, absolutely. The pain point, their pain point, their problem. What is it that there's irksome day to day, that problem that they just want somebody to solve? Maybe they have put together, cobbled something to help them solve that solution. If you do not understand that clearly, I think you would be dead in the water, really. If you do not understand the need of not just one or two, but if you have a bulk of, of customers who have a similar problem area that you know that you can solve, you've identified a market opportunity. But that all requires a lot of work to get to that point, okay? So think of your uh, I guess, quest to find that market opportunity as a journey. Um, and it is not very clear. It's unclear in terms of direction of how you would proceed there. Um, how many of you have traveled in countries where GPS doesn't mean anything and there are no road signs anywhere? Some of you. Um, so you know that you need a lot of information. They might say, you know, turn left at that red door in that house or, you know, and that big tree over there. <laughs> but you are, the, but the, the end goal of where you want to reach is so good that you make that effort to find the right people to talk to and get to that destination. So that's exactly what, how you should think of market customer intelligence as. It de-risks all of those decisions you're going to make about, how much to charge, what is their pain point, what are the features of your product, whatever it is that you need to be th thinking about. It de-risks that and all of those assumptions that you might be making about what channel, what price, all of that, you need to change that to facts, something to you know, hang your hat on, something that you tangibly, uh, more than a few people have told you is true, right? So that's what market customer discovery does. And therefore, hopefully, you have a clear pathway forward to uh, get to your market opportunity. 
So what kind of information are we talking about? See, there's some basics, um, but there's lots of depth and breadth to these things. You know, there's secondary market information. It's everything from what you read on the internet. There are government sites. There are market research reports that are written that are highly in depth. There are uh, tech blogs, etc. There's so much information out there. So be careful about how much of that you use and what you use for what purposes. But there's nothing to beat your primary uh, information. What I mean by that is your direct contact with your customers, what you infer from a conversation or telephone, direct interaction. So nothing to beat that. So maybe 60% of the information might come from secondary sources, but these are things people are reading about, writing about other markets and uh, possibly closer to, you, to your space, adjacent markets, or, uh, but it's not directly about your product. It's not specific enough, and the primary research is the only way you're gonna get uh, specific enough for your, for your needs. And it might be quantitative type of things. Uh, it might be things like, you know, you wanna know how many people uh, are, are making a certain type of income in a particular city, you know, it's like demographic type of stuff, or it's very qualitative, which is more opinion, it's more one-on-one -on -one basis type of information that you would get from talking to somebody. So, so you have all of this information. What are the, f I'm gonna go through a few steps in a kind of an order that, the logical order of, what is the first thing you're gonna ask about this journey? You want to know if this journey is worth it, right? You're, you're spending a lot of time. You may, most of you are probably in full-time jobs. You want to make sure that this journey is worth it. At the end of the day, uh, you want to make sure, am I going to make money here? Even if you're a social purpose business, you want to be sure that the cost is somewhat recoverable. Um, you know, you, you have to uh, you know, live. From this, from this business. So this is a very critical question and most entrepreneurs make a big mistake when they're figuring out market size. I'll give you an example, just a simple one. Um, let's take the LED lighting market. This is actually a $4 billion market in the world. It's a big market. Let's say that you are making a, a special type of LED lighting, but um, it's only applicable to the dimmable LED lights, just hypothetically. So let's assume the four billion now drops to maybe two billion. So the first part of the four billion usually is called a total market size. Obviously you may not be able to take a big chunk of that, but the servable market, the smaller one that you directly have a product to may be relevant to you. And then out of that two billion, you know, in the LED space, there's almost 10 large players like GE and Philips and so on. And then there's like 20, 30 smaller companies. If you make a decision to get into this space, you better be really sure that what you have is very different from all of these other players. And then maybe you have a chance to get that little bit of the pie of that two billion. This is just an example of that, but just for yourself, internalize it for yourself and in, in what you're working on and think about how much money can I really expect to make? So when you're talking to, you know, putting pitches together or market research documents or, you know, business plans together, be careful about what you say that is, what is your target market is. Make some logical assumptions so that you get to a number that makes sense, right? And one good news is there are market research firms that publish these kinds of things. It's their d job, day in and day out, that's how they make the money. They make these market research reports. I mean, I mentioned that I was in Frost and Sullivan. That's one of the things that we, we did for large corporate uh, companies. I managed the environment building technologies practice there. So when you have the opportunity to access a market research report, either through us, uh, you know, Carrie mentioned we have a, a market research team, uh, if you're a client of Mars or any of the regional innovation centers across the province, you can access market research uh, reports through us, if you're a client, and, and make sure you compare different 
reports because there are different ways uh, analysts slice and dice things. And also remember, there are people just like you, you and I, so the reports are only as good as the people. So make sure you're looking at reputable companies' reports so that you know, you know it's credible and they've actually done their homework. The other important thing is make sure you know the definition they're using. They might be, you know, they might say the Asia market, but they have written in fine print that they've decided to leave out Philippines and Thailand for some reason because they couldn't find data. You need to know this so that you're, they're accurate about what is it that you're comparing the information to. So this is all published information that's out there that you can use, provided you're, you know, in a, in a market space that's, that's something that's already been written about. Um, of course, it's a different story when it's a new segment that you're entering into, and we'll come to that. Uh, but you could leverage some of this published uh, stuff to come up with your market numbers. Of course, you could try and do your market sizing on your own. It's not easy. It's complicated. Um, but there are some ways you could do that. Um, for example, let's assume that maybe you have a particular type of uh, product that meets the need of um, individuals that have a particular handicap or, or disability or something like that. Um, there is ways to find out you know, how many people are affi afflicted by that you know, in the US or Canada. Uh, you can make an assumption of if it's a direct-to-consumer and not through a hospital, uh, can you hope to sell to half of them? You know, what would the price point be? And some come to some um, range of what the market revenues that you might be able to go after, provided there's no one else selling something similar in that space. Right? Um, so you might be able to take some of their market share away, or it's a completely brand new thing that nobody else has, and you could potentially be, you know, spend a lot of marketing, but be able to get uh, most of that for yourself. So there's ways to figure, or figure out, like a quick and, quick and easy way of figuring that out. Say you're a web kind of company, and I'm sure many of you are here, uh, you know that you can do a mock kind of website or see how many people are interested in that. You know, you're not going to, just because you built one site, they're not, not going to automatically know that you exist. You have to uh, invite people, and maybe they invite other people. They might leave their email addresses and so on. So you have a, some sense of, okay, there is interest there. People are, you know, so many thousand people came to my initial launch, and they're interested in what I'm doing. So you have a sense of who that number is. And maybe based on subscriptions for that site, you can decide how much you might be able to make. So these are different methodologies in which you use. And this is so critical, so important. You obviously don't want to go after something where you think there's no way I'm going to be able to make a decent amount of of money doing doing this type of business or have a some kind of value that you're associating with doing that business. And ultimately make realistic assumptions. Don't try to do global numbers all of all from uh, immediately try to do North America separately. It's very different from Asia, very different from Europe and so on. So make realistic assumptions whatever you do. Sorry, I realize I'm walking up and down here. Can you see the, the slides? I'll try to stay still. Um, the second really very important thing that you need to know after the market size is what kind of a market type am I selling into? And here, um, this is keeping with the analogy of, of a journey. Um, you want to know if somebody else has taken this journey before. It's, it's good if somebody else has. Then you can see what kind of, of uh, pathways they took and maybe you could take some of those lessons. Um, and that will be somebody in an existing market. Say, um, you know, it's a well-established space, but you know what, it's very challenging for a startup to get into an existing market because there's going to be very strong players who have uh, a big market share. Unless you have something completely disruptive that, that, um, that, is, that can come and take over customers, the existing players are not going to be you know, sitting around just waiting for you to take them, take their market. But they might be very aggressive. They might uh, buy buy you, which is, if you you think that's a good thing, that that's great. But that's that's definitely an opportunity there for them to do that. 
Um, the other often I found, we find the startups going into is the resegmented market, which is in an existing space of the market, there's a, a, a few buyers in there through specific uh, customer groups who have, uh, are okay with a low cost solution. They're okay that the product is just good enough and maybe you can capture that, that market. It's just, you know, they're, they're happy to pay less, but less, get less kind of features and so on. Or they have a specific need, so you could leverage that. Um, and the, a new market is something that you've completely come out of the water and it's totally different. You have, so uh, anybody, you've heard of Dropbox, everybody heard of Dropbox? It's pretty revolutionary, but Google is not too worried about Dropbox. Maybe because they are so good at search and all the other things, they're like, ah, oh, let, let those guys do their own thing in the corner there and we won't worry about them as much. But the other way of thinking, um, other examples I could give of you know, existing re and new, you know, you could think of you know, traditionally people who are movie lovers, you, know, you buy your DVDs, et cetera. You, we used to have Blockbuster, it doesn't exist, who thought they were kind of in that resegmented market, and then you have this Netflix people that came and that's kind of the, the equivalent of the new, that just got poof, they just disrupted all of that uh, in a big, big way. And a clone market is where something has been proven in one region and it's taken and exported into other, other, other spaces. Uh, I was talking to my team earlier and they felt this is a good example of a clone market. Have you heard of the company Uber? Anybody here? Some nodding heads? And um, you know they started in San Francisco. Basically, they, anyone who has a car can say, hey, you know, if you are interested in going from point A to point B, you can pay me and I can drive you there. Or instead, they'll say, I'm going from A to B. If anybody's interested to come with me, come, come and uh, uh, pay me to take you there. But it can't, Uber does, cannot operate in Toronto because the taxi drivers protested. You cannot be an Uber member unless you're a taxi driver here in Toronto. So that, that didn't work out here, but it, works, it worked in other cities. So that's a clone market, taking an example from one city to, to another. So the, the whole point of talking about all these different segments of markets, it is so critical for you to know where you fit in all of this because it is completely related to the next question we're gonna ask about who am I competing with? Because if you don't know the space that you're going to be in, uh, existing or new, you don't know who you're going to be bumping against. <laughs> I'm still in the, the journey analogy here um, as, you're, as you're driving your car to destination B. So it's critical for you to know who they are. Um, and I know I'll come to the next of why is it important for you to know who, who the competitors are because that's where your, com your customers are going to be where they're going to come from, right? Move from one place to another. So there are many resources, again, that you can rely on for understanding the companies that you might be competing with. And if it's a, if you're a high, uh, heavily IP-oriented um, startup, then there is some homework to be done on intellectual property, you know, patent analysis and so on. Anybody in the life sciences and the clean tech space here in the audience? Only two, three. God, you guys are all scared, you know, like, okay, I'm in life sciences. <laughs> it's not a bad thing. <laughs> um, so, so you know what it is, you know, to, it, uh, you know, intellectual pro property is very important. Um, other thing, other places in which you might be able to find technology product information is, you know, obviously, on company product websites, you, you'll be surprised how much information is in the public domain when large companies put out product uh, in, uh, information and specs and so on. When you go to trade shows, they have it there at the booth. So there's a lot of information you can just get from that um, if you know exactly who you're competing with. And of course, you know, keeping yourself abreast of what's happening technology-wise is 
very smart to do. We have our own uh, resource here called Mars uh, Startup Library. If you're interested, it's a free resource. You can go in there. Uh, there are many different uh, websites and so on you can go into to find um, you know, how do you go about looking for your competitors and, uh, and that stuff. And then we talked about the syndicated research reports. As they look at the market sizing, and the, the way they do, they do market sizing is they look at all of the competitors in that space, they have a tier one, maybe they make up 80% of the market perhaps, and so they know their revenues or sales numbers of those, and that's how they do the market sizing. So they know the market shares of the companies in that space too. So looking at these reports can be helpful if you are in a market that is very well defined, okay? I wanted to share this with you. As we're looking at uh, competitors and so on, um, typically uh, competitors, uh, startups like to draw this you know, XY kind of diagram where I'm over here, and all my competitors are over here. I'm so unique and different. I'm I'm over there, kind of thing. Um, you know, yes, you all want to. We all want to feel special. Um, everybody knows who Steve Blank is, yes. Uh, and he recently, sh maybe you've seen this article. Um, said, I'm the center of the universe. I'm in the middle. <laughs> he took it even one for one step further. But this is a neat way of looking at competitors. Um, you know, this is his company. You know, uh, lifelong learning uh, for for entrepreneurs. And he says, I don't know where my competitors are. They're probably in adjacent markets, like in the corporate sector, higher education, adult learning, etc. And then he filled all of those uh, paddles with all the names of different. Uh, competitors in that space. And then he went one step further and he added all of the new investments, no, the, all the new and cool companies who've had investments. You know, when you look at this, you can tell, ha, huh, okay, looks like a lot of VCs and angels are interested in investing in these kinds of companies. Maybe when you are sharing this, this insight with your angel or investor, they might get this feeling that, hey, look, I, ha I am you know, very close to this adjacent market that I pot potentially could get some of my customers from, and there's interest in this area. So you're able to demonstrate that through this type of a visual representation of, um, so I encourage you to do this exercise for yourself. You see, okay, if I'm here, who else, where else am I, are my customers gonna come from? So this is why it's good to know where your competitors are, okay? Everybody still with me? So finally, we've come to that point. We said, okay, is this journey worth to go take? You know, is this market big enough? Am I gonna make money? What type of a market am I gonna be in? You know, is this uh, gonna be new or existing? And depending on where I am, I'm gonna com compete with other giants or am I gonna be first out of the gate? Then we just figured out um, what kind of competitors will be there in those type of markets. And finally, now that we know who the competitors are, we know where their customers are going to come from. Um, here I'm gonna use the analogy of, okay, so there's I think almost equal male to female audience, or maybe not, we're more male to female. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna get beaten up at this example, I think. So <laughs> whenever I've traveled with, uh, my uh, uh, better half, he never ever stops to ask for directions. He will not get out of the car and ask for directions. We will just have to just wing it and just go there. So the females are laughing. So <laughs> if you have any hope of getting from A to B, um, and I know Steve Blank uses this as get out of the building. So I'm gonna use the same as a get out of the car. If you're in the journey and you have maps and all of this information, all this information that we've collected from secondary resource and so on, is not good enough. It's not gonna be enough. You have to make that giant leap and talk to somebody. I know it's very daunting, you know, it's just talking, but the minute it's about your product and so on, you know, your shoulders might just go like this. You know, I, I don't want to do this. I, I, I can't talk to people. Um, but you have to. Uh, and that is the only way you're going to understand what your customers need. Okay? Um, again, you can use secondary resources to understand what customers want. But it will be about 
other products and markets that you may not be interested in. It's okay, it's anecdotal, it's some, it'll give you some sense of what's going on. For example, there are big omnibus studies that you know, all these other companies like Forrester or, Com or I, um, uh, sorry, AC Nielsen, for example, do, but they may not ask the questions that you want to ask. They might do a big ob omnibus study with CIOs of of North America, but that one question that you wanted to ask is not going to be there because it was done for somebody else. So you have to do that for yourself. You need to ask that question to your, uh, your audience on your own. Um, there are industry associations, that's pretty much one for every single, I think, kind of sector. Um, they are really a great source of information. You know, whether you go to the trade show or online, there might be a presence there. Maybe there is a listserv group or blogs that they're writing that you can, you know, connect with them on, on, on things. If you're looking for international markets, you know, our, the government of Canada, there is a Department of Foreign Affairs and International Trade. They have representatives around the globe. They are really good sources of information on the ground. Uh, information. If you get to that point of international type of uh, of uh, sales, and last but not least, there's nothing that can can be replaced uh, that that can replace primary research. Your actual touch point with with customers. So there are many ways to do this. There are online tools, and of course your direct interviews. So let's take a few minutes and go through some of these things. Uh, so online tools are, you know, like I said, you know, maybe you have a mock website. Uh, you know, Google Sites is it's pretty easy to do. There's Weebly. There's many other ones like that. Um, you can embed a form in there. You can ask people to respond to things, um, and so on. Um, surveys for startups when you're starting out, it's not a good idea to do these big surveys, even though it's free. You know, you're already assuming the kind of uh, things that, they, that you want them to respond to, if it's a yes or no type of thing. There's, if there's open-ended questions, they may or may not answer it completely, right? And also, you don't know if, you know, respondents may not be truthful in surveys. Um, and if you have a precocious 12-year-old uh, like I have, who if he figures out that you can get paid for surveys, he might actually do something. Um, you know, to do, you know, you don't know who's on the other end is what I'm trying to say. It's a, is it the exact demographic you're reaching and so on. So you can use them, but not maybe later on, later stage, uh, not at the beginning uh, level. And um, we talked about listservs, specific interest groups that you want to poll. Um, you know, maybe it's a, a, a mom's group, they have a blog, or maybe it's a cancer survivors, whatever it is, depending on what that, that you're, the market you're going after. There are groups there that you can tap into. Um, I'm sure you all have heard of uh, different crowdfunding platforms like Kickstarter and Indiegogo and so on. Is anybody on any crowdfunding platform at the current time? Just this one person? Uh, so these are, does, does everybody know what, what crowdfunding platforms are? I'm assuming people know something about it. Um, a few hands up. Essentially, it's a it's your extended version of the friends and family. So these platforms enable you to tell the you may not actually have a product. You might say what the product might look like, and uh, you're in, you're asking inviting people to invest in your future product. Um, you know, just have to be mindful that you might expect 50, and then suddenly there's 1,000 people there, and you need to make sure that you've had lined up your manufacturers, channels, all of those things before uh, you get in there. But people are using that very in an innovative way to get more feedback on specifics of the product. You know, what color do you want? Do you like this feature? And based on who's, who's yes or no, because these are people pre-sales of products, so you can get feedback that way too. So, so the market research has evolved so much because of all of these online platforms. Traditional market research is, is actually going away. These are various types of ways in which you get feedback from your customers directly. And lastly, the direct interviews. Now, for, for somebody beginning, you know, if you're first year in your startup, this is what is critical. Face-to-face, -face, telephone interviews, hands down, most important. Uh, you leverage your friends and family to network, whether it's a 
direct to business sale or a consumer sale, it, you know, you can get referrals. You know, I'm looking for people who are, you know, really interested in uh, designer or something. <laughs> you know, it depends on what your ask is. And people might find, yeah, I know this person who would be really keen to, to, uh, um, to help with that. Or, and, and you can use your immediate, you know, uh, maybe sports team or, you know, uh, you're a member of something as almost your focus group, you know. Those, they don't cost anything at the moment. Those things are expensive if you outsource them, but you could actually do the, those on your own. And then, of course, your face-to-face -face and telephone interviews. I'm going to sp spend a little bit of time uh, telling you about some do's and don'ts of face-to-face -face interviews. And some people say, it's just talking. I can do it. <laughs> uh, or some people say, no, I, I, I'm totally not, I'm not ready to talk to anybody. Uh, but whatever sp space you are in, I cannot... Uh, you should not underestimate the preparation that you should put into uh, a direct interaction with someone. So 10 things, there are many things, but I've tried to squish them down to 10 things that you should remember. You need to be very clear about who your customer base is, okay? Be very specific, okay? And if you understand your solution clear enough, and you know the type of problem that you're trying to focus on, you should know, okay, it's women under 30 or at-home moms who have X need, or it's a middle management person in a company who's trying to get his distributors to talk to each other. It could, whatever it is, be as specific as you can be on what the persona is. And therefore, the ask, when you're asking someone, I'm looking for this kind of person for interviewing, then they can be more uh, helpful to you in telling you who, who they know in their network, right? Um, always ask for a referral. I mean, don't be shy. If they've mentioned somebody, then uh, request for an introduction by email or uh, something. Which will, the warm referrals are much better rather than somebody giving you a name and then you're sending them a note in Facebook. They're going like they're not going to respond to you. They're, they're like, oh, who's this crazy person sending me a, a tweet or a, or a Facebook message? So ask for a referral. Um, take time. Say, for example, you have you got the phone number of that individual. You got them on the phone. Don't be tempted to like interview them right there. <laughs> Just take time to set up the interview uh, and set up an expectation of what is it that you want to talk to them about. Don't say, "Oh, I just wanted to go for a coffee and you know talk to you about something." That uh, don't be vague. Be very specific and don't be shy. They might say no. That's the hard. You know, that's okay. No's are okay. But be specific, don't blindside them by saying something and what your intent is to something else, okay? Be specific about the expectation. Take time to clearly develop your questions ahead of time. Don't go in there with random things. Remember, you're going to do this over and over again for multiple people. Be consistent about the questions you're going to be asking. Have a template with you. It's okay, be prepared. One thing though, a word of warning, don't take a recorder. People don't like being recorded and they worry about what they say when they're being recorded. <laughs> so don't take a recorder, but maybe you take a, a co-member of your team so that you can concentrate on the interview and somebody's taking notes. You could do that maybe. Um, also, um, remember to pause. People who are afraid of talking, well, it's good. You shouldn't be talking. It's the customer who should be talking. You're there to listen. So just probe, you know, what is it that keeps them up at night? What is that one thing that the problem that they have? And listen. If you think that X, Y, and Z are the problems in the industry, state them and then just stop. Let them react. Maybe they're all the wrong problems. Maybe you were wrong that you thought those were the problems. You know what? That's actually good. If you thought they were wrong, there you found a person who tell you what the real problems are. You've discovered what it is. It's OK to be wrong in this case, right? And then maybe slowly introduce the next level of thing is, what are you thinking of? What is a possible solution? And stop. Let them react. So listening is very important skill here. It's not there, you're not there to just blurt out everything about what you are and what you're doing and all that stuff. 
It's about listening about what their needs are and how you can solve their needs, okay? Remember to record your answers after the interview, you will forget. Have your template, write it down in a whatever organized fashion. It will save you a lot of time after. Respect their time. If they, you said 20 minutes, stop at 20 minutes. Don't extend it beyond, don't extend your welcome. You can always go back to them after you've you know, refined things and use them as a sounding board when you have a better prototype to share with them. Don't forget to ask for referrals from these people. If these are the people who had those problems, they might know uh, three or four other people who had the same problem as this, uh, as them. Like you wanna expand your contact list, right? I think only like a few hands were up when I said 30 or more interviews. Uh, you, you should speak to as many as people as you can so that you understand that market space as best as you can. And last but not least, there is a way to convert the, all of this qualitative information that you're collecting and quantify it because you need to understand what insights you're gaining from this. So you might choose things like, you know, uh, and uh, there are many books out there, Lean Analytics and Steve Blank and so on, who have various ways in which you can convert qualitative responses to quantitative measures. So you pick things that matter to you, you know, they should be excited when they hear about the product, you know. Yeah, it should be important. Does it solve a business need for them? Do you think they'll pay to buy the solution? Uh, are, are they a decision maker? Those kinds of critical things that you think is important and then quantify it, like rate them one to three. So if you do that for you, one customer, you could do that for many other ones. And then collectively when you look at it, you'll, you'll, be, you'll come to a point where, wow, I did 10 interviews, they were all lukewarm. They were somewhere in the middle. Maybe these are not the right people I should be talking to. Maybe I got the wrong customer base. If they're not excited, then, then, then you're not talking to the right people. So you need to do those kind of things. And then refine your questions, find your, refine your contact list, and try it again, okay? It's a lot of work, I know, but we're talking about the rest of your life here. <laughs> it's your business. You have to put this amount of work into it. This is not a hobby, <laughs> hopefully. Um, and then, of course, now that you have really understood your customer base, you know how to find them. Maybe they're online shoppers, maybe they're gym members, <laughs> who knows? Depending on what you're trying to sell, you know exactly how to reach them. And then you figure out the business model. You know, how will they pay? What price will they pay? And, and so on. Voila. You've reached the end. So you've understood your customer, you have a solution they need, and you can solve their problem, a channel to reach them, a business model that makes sense where you can make money. And you've used all of this market customer intelligence through research that you've done, whether yourself or from other sources, to find a viable business opportunity. Make sense? Right? That's it, you arrived. <laughs> I'm happy to answer any questions you might have. Are you thinking, oh my God, this is too much work. Go ahead, please come forward to the mic. We have mic. two mics in the aisles. Shall I go ahead? Yes, please. Yes, first of all, thank you for your amazing uh, uh, workshop. It was very useful. <coughs> I have a question. So let's say uh, you are running your uh, marketing campaign and you are actually sending the direct emails to the people you, you know, and, uh, but you're receiving no response. So what would be the scenario? Like how, how would be you acting ethically? How much you will follow up and what would be the kind of time frame? So you are, you're saying you're, uh, you're sending emails to your potential customers? And you already you're... send them. You Sorry. already send the emails. Uh -huh. And you're expecting them to react and uh, answer, kind of somehow react this on This is your... marketing for a particular product, right? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Well, if you're not receiving any messages, there could be many things wrong here. Either they don't associate well with the product. So this is, I'm assuming you, maybe you bought a list. Did you buy a list from someone? No, no, it was a direct, like, like, like let's say, okay, let, let's go to particulars. 
I was on a show where I met some people, I collected their uh, business cards, ah, okay. and I said that, and we agreed that I'm going to send them the information yes, about my yes. product or service. Yeah. So I did that, yeah. and now I'm waiting for a few days to, to react and respond. So yeah. my dilemma is, okay, when do I follow up, how often I follow up, and what do I do? You know what, you have to be persistent, but at the same time, I think um, they're probably in the trade show, they've exchanged so many business cards. It's difficult. Sometimes people just say, yeah, sure, I'll, you know, you can follow up, and they're not uh, genuine about it. I would say when you go to trade shows, uh, try to have face-to-face -face meetings and longer conversations to get them excited about your product rather than just exchange cards no, because they may not remember. That's actually happened kind of. I didn't, I didn't throw the emails just uh, uh, blindly. Mm -hmm. It was, uh, I wasn't sure that yes, send us the information. Right. But I'm, I'm anticipating that these people are very busy, yes. but they need to be reminded. My question of is course. when and how often, like after you send the email, how long you wait till you follow up and how many times you actually follow up? It depends on what grade level of people you're talking about, if it's directors or VPs or, and so on. I mean, you should, it's your business. You should be persistent and you know, be polite and keep sending them emails. But uh, you know, I would say if there's, it's a trade show and if they, it happens every year or if it's more often than that, That's you should a, try and yeah. fix up another meeting. And maybe they didn't understand the product clearly or just the email is not enough to get their attention. They, you need to, Think of what else, what the content of the email is going to be. You know, if it's a long email, a lot of people don't read it. It really depends on what messaging you're putting in that email that helps them to open it up and see, right? Um, so it, it depends. It's, it's a combination of things. One is they didn't understand it. Maybe the, the messaging in the email was not clear enough. But I don't think you should stop from pursuing. You should obviously, you know, get back to them more often if you really think that's a critical buyer. Um, but you should also go to multiple people maybe within that organization, not depend on one contact. There might be someone else who really needs, it, this is, we didn't get into this, but uh, there's a, something called customer type as well. Maybe the person that you spoke to is uh, maybe not in a place where they, they immediately get served by that product. You're not fixing their pain point necessarily, you're fixing somebody else's pain point, maybe you need to reach them. Maybe this guy is the decision maker who just signs a check. But you need to get to somebody else who actually wants it. So maybe that's why the replies are not coming. I'm just giving you some suggestions. I, I'm not sure what the situation is. Okay. but Thank you very much. Yeah, hopefully that's of some use. Um, Sorry, whoever's in the mic next. Right, we have mics in the aisles. Yeah. If you could use the mics, please. <laughs> I think that gentleman had a question, but if you, sure, uh, sure. Sometimes needs can be created. Yes. So that's a that's a new market, right? Uh, like you know, in my opinion, like a Facebook is like a created need, you know, did we need Facebook? Did we, is it an essential part of our lives? It has become an essential part of our lifestyle. Twitter has become an essential part of our lifestyle. You know, but we existed fine without it before. There were other social, you know, kind of platforms where people were sending emails to each other. So yes, of course, that's where the new category comes, new market category comes into play. Sorry, go ahead. Hi, I have a question about uh, refining questions, uh, refining, yeah, questions. Uh -huh. uh, so I did a lot of interviews, uh, and then at the end of the day, I drew a line. This is what I uh, learned about these customers. And for some reason, when I refined the questions, and I went out again uh, to find customers to do the interviews, somehow uh, the data changed. Um, I don't know if that's because the way I approach it, because the, the context, like where I did the interviews, uh, do you have any... Uh, so were the type of customers the same? Uh, yes. So you know what, it is, I don't know if the responses were uh, positive or negative because it, the, the volume, you know, you, you could have 10 positive responses and you think, perfect, I'm on the right track. And then you get one bad one and you're thinking, oh my goodness, I've kind of, it's 
uh, shaken my confidence level. But you need that's why you need enough volume of it so that what you think is the truth is not truth for, because you're not gonna make a business from sell, selling to 10 people, right? You should have a basic offering that you can sell to thousands. So if, when you, if it's changed, so it has something to do with it, the, the solution also change along with it? Maybe it's a, you're on a good track then. Maybe the, the first set of interviews led you in a different pathway because there were a fewer number. And if you, if you refined it, maybe this next set is going to reveal something totally different about you, what your offering is going to be. So I, I don't know enough details to tell you more, than, more yeah, than that. That's fine. All right, thank you. You're welcome. Hi, Isha, I have a question regarding uh, one of the tools that you list under online tool, yes. social media. So how do we use social media in order to conduct our market research? Can you give some examples? Sure. I don't know in a, in a startup mode if that might be the best way because you know your your trademark your 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 secret sauce is important. But you know large corporations like you know uh, I can give you one example like P&G or Coca-Cola or different oh, many companies. If you're on Facebook, you could see them all the corporate brands. They tr tend to launch different ideas or products to get people to to like or dislike or uh, comment. Uh, P&G uses this effectively to reach their teenage audience because they are not going to pick up the phone and do a survey on you know, hygiene products and so on. So they, get, they only interact with them on Facebook. And then they can get, you know, do you, want, do you want the package in this way? Or do you, what do you like and dislike? So that's what I mean by social media. But in a startup mode, you have to be careful how much you're going to reveal about what you're going to be doing. Um, so I wouldn't recommend it as the first top thing to use. But did you understand how you might be able to use it? Sure. And how yeah. does it differ from doing it through mock websites? Sorry, say that again? And how does it compare to doing a research on mock on mock website. Mock website. Oh, so, so in the Facebook, you're connecting with a network that you have, right? A mock website is, you know, your you know, prototype of a, whatever product that you're saying you're, you're going to have. And you have an email. It's broader than your, just your immediate Facebook network, right? You're, you're inviting one set of people, and then they might be sharing with others, and then they might come and look at it, like, yeah, this is really interesting. And you might have, say, say something like, uh, you know, if you, if you really would like to know more about when it's launched, leave your email address, and they might do that. So it's a much broader. So it's, it's a landing page reach. that you're talking about. That's right, that's okay, right. That's great, thank you. Yes. Hi, Usha. Um, I just had a question about uh, asking about pricing. Is yes. there a good way of phrasing uh, or asking a question about pricing where they don't answer for free? <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, of course. We don't want that word free. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, it, you know, so it's, uh, that's a really good question. So it really depends on how badly they want the solution. You know, at the end of an uh, interview, if they say, well, okay, it may not have happened to anybody yet, but I'm just saying, I'll, I'll, this is my checkbook. What's the solution? Whatever it costs, just you know, give it to me kind of thing. So the pricing really depends on how much the market will bear. That's really how you have to think about it. So rather than you volunteering what the price is, you might ask the customer, how much do you think you, they might pay for this type of a solution so that you're not locked down into a, a price point. That's a good way to go as a startup because, hey, this might be the most critical thing for them and they're willing to pay 10,000 and you're here you are worried about saying 1,000, right? You don't wanna, right? You don't wanna do that. So, and you also should have tiered pricing. As you grow your business, there might be uh, certain customers, I mean, you know, multi in multi-sided markets, it might be free for some and it might not be for others. So, and in, depending on how big a problem they have, you should increase the pricing based on who you're serving. Does that help? Yes. Yeah. Okay, that's great. Thank you, Yusha. Okay. Okay. Hi. If you're dealing with um, a new product where you don't have a lot of market research to access, yes. do you think it's um, credible to use just primary research from a small segmented group of your own individual research to build out um, credible sales forecasting? Yes, it is, but 
remember that petal diagram we, sh we, yeah. we talked about, the adjacent markets? There must be, there might be something they're using now to solve that, you know, unless it's completely out there and not similar. There must be something adjacent that you can think of and use that as a gauge you know, to, for market sizing to say, okay, if there are you know, 300 people using that solution and they, they like that, there's a chance that some of them might migrate over to, to mine. So you, you can use some of it. But and yes, you could use primary research for how, sure. How do you really access how many people are using those competitive, similar products? It's really... It, it is hard, it, especially, you know, I know we, we talked about um, publicly traded and private right. companies. It's, you know, I come from the clean tech space. Almost everybody is private, private companies, and it's very difficult to under, know how, ma how many customers there are. You know, in those kind of areas, you know, if you could get some inside track on who is in that company, you know, roughly, you know, you know, do you have thousand customers? So if you have, if you go to a trade show, if that's kind of a that kind of a space, you know, doing a little bit of a, what do you call it? Uh, pretend to be a customer, right. uh, you know, at their booths and asking questions. You have to use all this type of various yeah. types of uh, insight. Yeah. From, from different spaces to get to an answer. I mean, yeah. they do put out, more, even private companies put out annual reports, they have tax right. filings. You could get some you know, information from that too. You know, they usually brag about their top product. You know, if they have only two, three products and their pro top product is 90% of the market share, mm -hmm. you, you could figure out some, some numbers from that too. Right, Yeah. okay, thank yeah. you. You're welcome. Hi. Um, I was wondering if you could share some best practices in sort of identifying pain points. Would it, would it be sort of some of the stuff you already mentioned about understanding your customer? Yeah, so I'm assuming that if you are thinking of a, uh, thought of an idea, it most of the time stems from you yourself having faced that problem in some way or someone else in your, you know, friend or family having faced that problem because, you know, you might, in your current job or in your, uh, you know, past job, you might have faced that kind of problem. It usually, I'm not saying always, but usually stems from that. So you have some assumptions as a result of that of what the problems might be. So stick to, you know, five or six main things that you think are assumed problems. But go open in, in your customer interviews so that I think from understanding this industry market space, I think these are some problems. What do you think? Get them to, to, to talk about it. And that's how, and then you start building, as you speak to more number of people, you start building that list and you refine it more and more and get more specific as a result. So, so I guess from what you just said, um a systematic way to sort of identify would be sort of start with from, from some personable problems. I mean, I, as, as, a, as a starting point. As a, as a, you know, if you, I'm assuming that's how, you know, people usually, you know what, this bugs me. This is, this is what I'm going to come up with as a solution. It comes from your own internal pain points, right? Usually. Yeah. So use that as a starting point. Uh, or if it's somebody else you know when you're trying to solve their problem, their pain points. So there will be at least one starting point for sure for you. Thank you. Okay, you're welcome. Hi, Osha. Uh, I'm just wondering if your target market or your target customer is actually corporates uh, or clients in the enterprise world, uh, how easy is it to get to these kind of uh, customers? You know, especially it's, you know, it's, it's hard to reach these kind of people just by phone calls or yeah. um, it's much harder than just posting, you know, for uh, yeah. consumers. Yeah, absolutely, business to business. You know what, uh, I hate to in, uh, talk about trade shows again, but if you are from a, you know, friends and family can, should still be able to help in case you, they have, know someone in a particular business. Uh, go to events where that customer is going to be. You know, figure out what kind of events and conferences that customer is going to be, and you have to show up there. That's how you're going to make that contact. Uh, well, I'm, I'm, I'm actually more, uh, uh, like uh, worried about how can I actually discover the market uh, size because it, it business to business sometimes it's, it's very unclear and who's the big big players in there especially when trying to develop a new product and, and give it try to show it to these corporates as a 
it's a must have in this time? Yeah. So in those, is, I mean, for sure you should be, I mean, unless it's, uh, you know, these market research firms that I talked about, they publish on almost everything. So you can definitely leverage those kind of uh, reports to, to figure out roughly what kind of who has the lion's share of the market and who's a big player. You should be able to get that from just secondary stuff. But then when you've honed in on a few companies that you think, okay, you know, my product is a good fit for these companies, then you get to the next step of going to those you know, because you want a face-to-face -face interaction. Nobody's going to come and respond to you by, you know, okay, telephone interview, forget it. You know, directly calling somebody or emailing. So you have to find the face-to-face -face opportunities for that kind of people. But then you need those individuals within those companies who will be your, I think Steve Blank calls them the evangelists, or the ones that see your vision. See that the product, when you explain it, they have this, they're bright-eyed and they're like, yeah, I need that. I need that so badly. So you need those individuals. It's a lot of work, but you need those individuals who see the same kind of vision and then work your way up. Um, actually, one of the things when you're selling B2B, don't get into the trap of going into these big uh, group corporate meetings. It's terrible way of you know, trying to meet the needs of multiple people because each of them have different incentives. You know, the one person might be the one who directly uses your product. There are others who are, you know, so are lukewarm, but they're external, and others who are the check signers and so on. So individually approach. Have that person introduce you to the next level and to the next level. So that level of commitment is needed to get into the, the corporate. Just like you said, you know, it doesn't work to just randomly email and, you know, uh, connect people with that way. But that one person is what you need inside. And so one more question. Uh, so if, if you were lucky enough to get actually someone in, in those business or corporates to try your product, should you offer, for example, to try it first time for free? Or should you talk about, you know, should you do your first business for, like, for free just to get a, a name on, on your website, on your product, as a client that has been using it? Make sure you sign. I mean, there are, I think, depending on what is it that your product is, if it's a web product or whatever. It's a web product, for example, for okay. services to clients right. in the business. Yeah, there yes. are, I mean, you know, that's, an, that, that's a good way of getting feedback, right? Uh, there are, I mean, I, I have a client who is a web client, and they do offer things uh, for free. Make sure, you know, sometimes if it's, if it's, there is some, you know, intellectual property there, make sure you sign some NDA or something with that, uh, with that individual. Don't just give it away for free. Um, but yes, I think I would en encourage you to try it, but keep a timed amount. You know, it's free for a certain number of, you know, don't keep it unlimited and then, you know, restricted to how many people. It, it, just be careful about how you, you know, because once you, that's the biggest thing, dif difficulty, to make it free and then get them to pay after. It's very tough. So you just have to watch out for, for that. And that's why, you know, it's good to, Maybe the, the, the prototype A is free, but then the B is not, you know? So it's okay to just, there's not a rule per se, there's different ways to do that, but um, yeah, I would encourage you to try it. Yeah. Thank you so much, appreciate it. Okay, we do have to end here, Usha, but will you be available for questions yes, after? Yes, absolutely, okay. I'm, I'm here for a little bit more time. Great, thank you everyone for coming. Have a good evening. <laughs>